I went to graduate school in San Francisco starting in the year 2020 to study sustainable development. And during my first semester, there were devastating wildfires in Northern California. Although I was removed from the more immediate dangers of this tragic event, I, along with everyone else in the Bay Area at the time, witnessed what would become known as Orange Skies Day. The day when the sky over the bay turned a fiery orange, casting an ominous golden hue over the buildings and the surrounding terrain. I went to graduate school after years of working in the nonprofit space, and I left what was essentially a dream job, because I, like many people today, believe that our current path is driving a number of environmental issues and social issues. Orange Skies Day, for myself personally, was an eerie confirmation that I was right where I should be in San Francisco, studying sustainable development and doing what I could to contribute to change. And for many, it was a warning of more challenges to come should we not change the path we are on. As we assess the situation from the local and global levels, it is important to locate potential key driving factors that are driving the environmental and social challenges we're facing today. In my graduate studies, I came across an approach, an approach to economics that, according to proponents, is in greater harmony with the natural world and facilitates more social health and cohesion. This approach is called degrowth. Degrowth argues that an important step in the right direction is to abandon our obsession with GDP growth and to abandon its use as a metric of well-being and progress. This might sound excessive and counterproductive even, but ecological economists and social researchers argue that this obsession with GDP growth is a key driver of environmental and social challenges. GDP, put simply, is the sum monetary value of goods and services produced over a given period of time. GDP will rise and fall depending on the amount and value of services and goods produced by a local economy, the global economy, uh, and a national economy. And currently, economists and political leaders use this as a metric of progress and well being for the economy, but also for society more broadly. And it sounds harmless enough, but there appears to be an inherent correlation between GDP growth and a number of environmental stressors. If we look at this chart here, we see that as GDP increases, the amounts of carbon emissions tend to follow a similar trajectory. GDP rises and car carbon emissions rise. This is exact, exactly the opposite of what we want due to the fact that carbon emissions are directly tied to global warming temperatures. And because the global economy is currently propped up by fossil fuels, it is unlikely that we will reduce carbon emissions with increasing GDP. This, however, isn't the only point of concern. As we see here in the same chart, as GDP increases, the amount of resources we consume increases. This is measured here by material footprint. Material footprint calculates things like water use, land use, and mineral, mineral use, for example. What's concerning about this is that researchers locate the sustainable threshold of material footprint at 50 billion metric tons. According to the UN, in 2017, our global material footprint was at 92 billion metric tons, greatly surpassing the sustainable threshold. And the UN projects that in 2060, we will more than double this figure and could potentially reach 190 billion metric tons. The impact of the global economy on the environment has been an explicit concern of governments for decades, leading many to sign on to the Paris Agreement, which aims to keep global warming temperatures below 2 degrees Celsius and ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius. As of November 2022, we were at 1.2 degrees Celsius, and more recent calculations are even higher. The repercussions of this can already be felt. The seas are rising, threatening to displace significant numbers of individuals and communities across the planet. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change notes an increase in frequency and severity of weather-related events across virtually every region. Another unfortunate repercussion is the extensive loss of biodiversity. 
Scientists warn that we are fast approaching, if not already in the midst of a sixth mass extinction, comparable to only five other events in the Earth's entire history. And this is being driven largely by the overuse of resources and claim, uh, changing environmental patterns. Today, GDP growth is the dominant is an aim of most world governments, including the United States. We are pursuing GDP growth for its own sake and not considering whether it is an appropriate metric. The interesting thing is the creator, the economist behind the creation of GDP, Simon Kuznets, he warned against this very thing. In the 1930s, Kuznets presented gross national product as a useful accounting tool to governments, but he cautioned those using it saying that it should not be the sole metric by which we measure economic progress. And I can't help but wonder what Kuznets would be thinking today. His um, warnings unfortunately went unheeded and GDP growth is the aim of most world governments. GDP unfortunately omits key indicators of well-being, oversimplifying our understanding of progress. In response, degrowth is a call to abandon the idea that progress is inherently tied to GDP. The genuine progress indicator has been presented as a potential alternative to GDP. The indicator takes into account that which GDP omits, namely environmental and social costs. For example, GDP considers what is being produced and whether it's contributing to things like an increase in pollution, a decrease in leisure time, and how the wealth produced is distributed. If we look at this graph here, we see that GDP has been steadily rising, suggesting progress. But the genuine progress indicator, which again takes into account the environmental and social, the indicator suggests that progress has actually stagnated for quite some time. I used the genuine progress indicator as an example, but there are other metrics too. If we abandon the belief that GDP growth and progress are synonymous, then we, the door is open to utilizing other metrics that help us better address the environmental and social challenges we're facing today. As the late ecological economist Herman Daly said, future progress simply must be made in terms of things that really count rather than the things that are merely countable. And the tide is, if, is shifting in this direction. People and governments are recognizing GDP's inadequacies. For example, just this past year in Brussels, there was a Beyond Growth Conference where many people gathered, including politicians, exploring alternative approaches to economics that shift us away from the harmful emphasis of GDP growth. In the United States, the state of Maryland utilizes and updates the Genuine Progress Indicator annually to inform its economic and social policy though it's the only state to currently do so. And there are growing conversations within local communities about what the purpose of the economy should be. For example, in Pomona, California, there's a multi-year long project underway exploring how the local economy can better facilitate well-being for its community, especially for those most disenfranchised and also how the economy can better protect and steward local bioregions. I encourage us all to actively start and engage in these kinds of conversations wherever we call home, exploring what purpose, what progress really means to us in our communities and what values we want centered. I encourage us all not to just reflect on these things, but to take concrete action based on this more holistic understanding of progress and well-being. And if we do, we may just make progress towards a healthier planet, greater uh, well-being, and a more sustainable existence. Thank you.